Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Ken Mengus, Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Boston University. On behalf of Chairman Kenneth Feld and all the trustees and overseers, it is my honor to declare the 144th commencement of Boston University is now in order. I ask that you please remain standing for the national anthem to, to be led by Ms. Marissa Plotti, who is graduating with her bachelor's degree in music from the College of Fine Arts. And following the anthem, remain standing for the invocation. The invocation will be delivered by the Reverend Dr. Robert Allen Hill, Dean of Marsh Chapel. Thereafter, President Robert Brown will preside over the ceremonies. To begin a psalm and a prayer, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God, it is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Gracious God, holy and just, upon this joyous day, we offer our thanks for the psalmist's revelatory sentiment that gladness itself, happiness itself, joy itself are ultimate service, that gladness itself serves. We offer our prayer of thanks in faithfulness to all generations. And now in prayer we pause with the generations that have preceded us here at Boston University, who lived out of a particular tradition, spirit, name, a gladness of heart, a gladness meant for all, not just some, but all, not just neighborhood, but universe, not just, not just nation, but world, with gladness of heart, Howard Thurman said, people, all people, belong to one another, not some, but all. With gladness of heart, Martin Luther King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice, not neighborhood, but universe. With gladness of heart, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, which gave birth to Boston University, said, the world is my parish, not the nation, but the world. Dear God, gracious God, holy and just, help us to hold on to the gladness and the joy and the happiness of this moment all the days of our lives. 
that we may ever make a joyful noise to thee with all the lands, that we may serve thee with gladness, 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 gladness. Amen. Please be seated. Good afternoon and welcome to Boston University's commencement exercises. It is a pleasure to welcome the graduates and their guests and also to welcome those of you who are joining us via broadcast on the radio and on the internet. I now present Mr. Maxwell Robodeau, a senior who will receive his bachelor's degree from the College of Arts and Sciences. He will speak on behalf of the class of 2017. Mr. Robodeau. Before I begin, I'd like to thank President Brown, the BU Board of Trustees, Dean Elmore, the BU faculty, my parents, and my fellow students. Of all that I am fortunate enough to possess in life, there is nothing that I value more than the education I have received here at Boston University. When I say education, I am not simply referring to the facts and figures, the names and dates, or the terms and categories that typically come to mind when one imagines the substance of college coursework. That which I truly cherish, that which has made the stress, tedium, and exhaustion of the college experience all worthwhile, is not the factual information itself, but rather the methods and the principles that have been instilled within me by my instructors and by my peers. My time as an undergraduate has given me the ability to think critically and ask probing questions instead of simply accepting claims at face value. The inspirational writings of humanity's revolutionaries have granted me the courage to challenge the status quo and to demand social change. The tenets of empirical research have fostered within me the intellectual integrity to make informed decisions based upon quality evidence, not based upon my own assumptions or subjective beliefs. My own failures have fortified my humility, which enables me to acknowledge my shortcomings and own my mistakes instead of attempting to save face. My interactions with my peers, you all, have bestowed me with the decency to seek to understand individuals who are different from myself. These values and principles are the facets of my BU undergraduate education that I will carry with me forever. I am confident that you, my peers, have learned these same lessons regardless of your respective fields of study. We all now share in the same responsibility to allow what we have gained here at BU to inform the intellectual and ethical standards by which we will abide from this day forward. This imperative is particularly pressing given contemporary events and global trends. Since the Enlightenment, humanity's progress has been owed to high standards of intellectual rigor. Logic, reason, objectivity, evidence, honesty, these are the pillars of both the sciences and the structure of our societal institutions. In the year 2017, these principles are under siege. Billions of people live under oppressive authoritarian regimes that rule through disinformation and the prohibition of certain facts. In liberal democracies, slogans painted on campaign buses feature false promises. Websites traffic in fake news conspiracy theories and executive spokespersons disseminate alternative facts. This type of discourse is entirely antithetical to the intellectual values that we have learned here at BU. I'm glad you agree. We are all fortunate and privileged to have received a college education. 
Recognizing this need not diminish the fact that we earned our degrees due to individual merit. However, we must be cognizant that the vast majority of people in this world are never granted this opportunity. Consequently, we now find ourselves among a select group. That membership comes with responsibility. It is our ethical duty to uphold and propagate intellectual integrity. For we cannot expect those beyond the realm of academia to respect this principle if we do not do so ourselves. As we gather here today upon the precipice of entry into global society, I implore that we truly take these principles to heart and abide by them throughout all of our future endeavors. We, the educated members of global society, must recognize our responsibility to uphold the values instilled within us by our alma mater. Let us never stop asking critical questions. Let us never allow fear to stifle our voices when we witness dishonesty or injustice. Let us never make important decisions without first researching and considering all of the relevant facts. Let us never be too prideful to admit when we have made an error. Let us never stigmatize those who are different from us instead of seeking to understand such individuals. Let us never become ignorant about our society, human nature, or the natural environment. Finally, let us never forego an opportunity to educate those around us. Let the historical record show that we, the Boston University class of 2017, did not succumb to complacency, but instead rejected the concept of a post-truth world with all of our collective tenacity, intellectual capacity, and human decency. Thank you and congratulations to the class of 2017. Thank you, Mr. Robodeau. I would now like to call upon Victoria Alacojo and Louis Beatty, both of whom are graduating seniors from the Questrom School of Business. Thank you, President Brown. As civil rights leader and former dean of Marsh Chapel once said, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. Throughout our four years here at Boston University, each and every one of us have come alive and thrived due to the many contributions to this community, both inside and outside of the classroom. Today, as we become BU alumni, we think back on what and whom have contributed to making BU our home. Both through academics and extracurriculars, we have formed bonds and friendships with mentors, professors, and each other that will last forever. Over the course of our senior year, we have set out to ensure Terriers will have the same amazing experiences we encountered through donating to the class gift campaign. You all made gifts to a variety of funds, helping efforts like the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground, the Catholic Center, your respective schools and colleges, and my personal favorite, BU's African Students Organization. With 2,750 participants, the 2017 Class Gift Campaign was the most successful campaign in Boston University history. We would like to thank the Class of 2017 
for their incredible generosity, our very dedicated board and committee members, and our immensely supportive supervisors. As we set out to start the next chapter of our lives as Boston University alumni, we will continue contributing both our resources and our time to build an even better BU. President Brown, on behalf of Boston University's newest alumni, it is my pleasure to announce the 2017 class gift for the amount of $60,000. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alakoto and Mr. Vitti, and thank you, the class of 2017. The class gift is a tangible expression of your commitment to Boston University. This commitment began when you first enrolled as students and is confirmed today as you move into the ranks of alumni. In the life of a university, faculty come and go, presidents come and go, but alumni are its constant the unending link of its past, present, and future. I am now pleased to present Wayne Positon, president of the Boston University Alumni Council, who will speak to you on behalf of the Alumni Association. Mr. Positon. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Congratulations, class of 2017. As of today, on behalf of 326,000 BU alumni, I offer you well-earned congratulations on the completion of your degrees. And to your parents, family members, and significant others who are with you today, I thank you as well for all the support you provided. Today, you have completed one journey, and you now embark on another. Being from New Jersey, is anybody here from New Jersey? Exit 145. At last year's commencement, I made some remarks about fellow Jerseyans Bon Jovi, Yogi Berra, and Frank Sinatra. The next morning, as my wife Susan and I were checking out of our hotel, a fellow approached us and said, how you doing? I said, you must be from Jersey, right? He says, right. He says, you're the guy who spoke at my daughter's graduation yesterday, right? I said, yeah, that would be me. And I said, uh-oh. He said, you know, you did fine, but I got a bone to pick with you. You talked about Yogi, you talked about Frank, you talked about Bon Jovi, but you never said anything about going down the shore, Taylor Ham, but you never said forget about it. I said, sir, I promise you that I will remedy that next year, so I have delivered on my promise. I hope you're here today with another graduate. Today, on behalf of all those terriers who have come before you, I welcome you to our BU Alumni Association. Our alumni live in 185 countries around the world, in today's world of social media, 230,000 of them are on LinkedIn, and 73,000 follow Facebook. So you're always just a click away from another terrier. You have witnessed the incredible transformative uplift of this university under the leadership of Dr. Brown and the Board of Trustees. You have joined with your record-breaking class gift in being part of the incredible success of our continuing capital campaign. We are truly all proud of what we see going on here at BU. An old New England saying comes to mind, a rising tide lifts all boats. I know we all feel that rising tide and the growing value of our BU education and experience. When you come back in 2018 for Alumni Weekend and thereafter, you will be welcomed to the new Alumni Center at the renovated Century Old Castle, which we had a ceremony to break ground on a renovation starting tomorrow. Another long thought about pipe dream, which is now becoming a reality. It underlines the commitment and involvement of all of us in the BU community. Of course, we hope to see you all this fall at Alumni Weekend. I like to say that people should never forget where they came from. That applies to all of us as alumni. You will take a variety of paths from here, some to graduate school, some to jobs, some to other forms of service. Our expectations for you are very high. With that, success comes responsibility responsibility to your families, your communities, and yes, to where you came from, Boston University. The BU Alumni Association will be there to help you. Some 50,000 BU alumni gather at events 
about 900 times a year, nearly three times a day all over the world. Stay involved, participate, be there to do your part on contributing to the continuing success that all of us share in, as an important part of the BU community and to make sure that others have the opportunity to follow us in the future. We live in a challenging world. In my lifetime, things that once looked impossible have now become realities. Northern Ireland, peace. In Berlin, a wall went up and I saw it come down. That's what happens to walls. It takes time, commitment, and perseverance to accomplish positive change. So I ask each of you to go forward, make all of us at BU proud, be part of us, and be someone who makes a positive difference in our world. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Positon. Teaching is an art. It is also one of the most important functions of a university, as it helps to mold the next generation of informed citizens and creative thinkers, many of whom are here today. The late Dr. Arthur G.B. Metcalf, an alumnus, faculty member, and trustee, founded and endowed the, the Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching at Boston University to recognize great practitioners of this art. Candidates for the award are nominated by members of the Boston University community, and a committee of faculty and students then submits its recommendations to the university provost and to me. It is indeed difficult to select a winner of the Metcalf Cup and Prize because all the candidates are outstanding. Two finalists in the competition will receive the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Will Dean Sandro Galea of the School of Public Health present the winner of the 2017 Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching? President Brown, it is my real honor to present Professor Sophie Godley, winner of the 2017 Metcalf Award. <laughs> Professor Sophie Gottlieb has taught at Boston University since 2003, first as an adjunct lecturer, and since 2011 as a clinical assistant professor of public health. She is the rare educator who fulfills the multifaceted ideal of teacher, mentor, motivator, innovator, scholar, and role model. While expert at the fundamentals of teaching, Professor Godley also explores non-traditional ways of challenging students. Her methods range from group learning and didactic discussion to innovative use of technology, including video, podcasts, and social media. She teaches not only theory, but how to apply it to solve complex public health problems. Professor Godley has also become a resource for faculty looking to improve their own classroom skills. She generously shares best practices and her experiences with teaching strategies and technology. Her ex extensive experience as a public health practitioner working with populations at risk for HIV AIDS and teen pregnancy make her a credible and reliable resource for students. Student evaluations paint a picture of an open, honest, thoughtful, passionate professor who creates an amazing learning environment and is a safe haven, safe haven for difficult discussions. Says one student, she helped prepare and empower me to go into the world and be an effective catalyst for change. Another says, she is the epitome of everything I want to be in life. Little wonder then that Professor Godley has received more than a dozen teaching awards. Today, Boston University is proud to add, her, to, add to that total by presenting her with the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching.
Will Dean Maureen O'Rourke of the School of Law present the winner of the 2017 Medcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching? President Brown, I have the honor to present Gary Lawson, winner of the 2017 Metcalf Award. A member of the Boston University School of Law faculty for 17 years, Gary Lawson is an exceptional and unique professor of law. He deals with symptoms of Asperger syndrome, a challenge he has turned into his advantage. Eschewing mainstream law school pedagogy, which demands a highly interactive technique, he has instead developed a lecture-based method that emphasizes his extraordinary ability to present complex ideas in an organized fashion that makes them accessible to students. What a method it is. Professor Lawson has earned multiple prestigious teaching awards, and he receives consistently glowing evaluations. Students describe a fair, honest, kind, witty, smart professor who is clear, thorough, and engaging, and can make a dry subject entertaining. The words awesome and amazing pepper their reviews. He is equally appreciated by his colleagues who admire his expertise in administrative and constitutional theory and history. They marvel at his ability to master and effectively teach subjects outside his areas of expertise, often on short notice. Says one colleague, I cannot overstate the value of Professor Lawson. He is a challenging, rigorous, open-minded, and even-handed intellectual. Professor Lawson is prodigiously published, serves on the board of directors of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies, and is on the editorial advisory board of the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. Nevertheless, he always places a priority on educating new generations of outstanding lawyers. For this, Boston University is proud to present Professor Lawson with the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Will Dean O'Rourke from the School of Law present the winner of the 2017 Medcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching? President Brown, I have the honor to present Naomi Mann, winner of the 2017 Metcalf Cup and Prize. From the day she joined, the Boston University School of Law in 2013, Naomi Mann has been indispensable as both educator and administrator. A widely respected practitioner of civil litigation, she brings experience, inspiration, and extraordinary educational skills to the law school's civil litigation clinics. Her dedication to developing the curriculum and pedagogical methods for the changing legal profession has helped the law school gain recognition as an educational innovator. One shining example is her leadership role in the creation of the Lawyering Lab, a highly successful first year simulation designed to teach client counseling skills, teamwork, negotiation, and contract drafting. As a clinical professor, Professor Mann engages students in creative problem solving, legal argument, and legal writing. Students praise her as an amazing teacher, patient, thor thorough, and inspirational, who is passionate about her students, her clients, and the evolution of the law. They also cite her ability to instill in students the confidence to accomplish feats that they did not know they were capable of. Colleagues share that respect. One considers her to be light years ahead of clinical teachers, while others describe her as a gifted teacher, manager, negotiator, and diplomat who is passionate and devoted to her students. Professionally, Naomi Mann advocates for the civil rights of the disadvantaged, particularly victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. She brings that same sense of fairness
She brings that same sense of fairness and commitment to shaping tomorrow's lawyers, which she does so spectacularly. In a school of law renowned for the quality of its teachers, Naomi Mann stands out as one of the very best exemplars of the art of teaching. We are honored to present Professor Mann, the university's highest teaching honor, the Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching. We will now present the candidates for the university's honorary degree. Will, will Trustee Sharon Ryan escort our honored guest to the podium? Over there. Mr. Trustee President. Ryan. Mr. Mr. President. I have the honor to present Jean Knox for Boston University's highest honorary degree. When asked to describe you, people have a difficult time. It's not that they are at a loss for words, quite the opposite. You have been described as courageous, compassionate, confident, comfortable, committed, caring, and that's just the letter C. Such is the dynamism of your personality. It is no surprise that, then that your 14 years as chairman of the Boston University Parents Leadership Council has been some of the most dynamic in BU's history. Your efforts are legendary. You have attended so many summer orientation programs that we have lost count. And your work here in our community reflects that same passion and compassion you brought to your career as a nurse caring for high-risk mothers and children, and in your role as director of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation of Fairfield County. <laughs> Under your guidance, the Parents Program has grown from a two-person operation to a major program of the Dean of Students Office. You have involved thousands of our students' parents in the life of the university and made them confident in trusting their children to our care. You tirelessly represent Boston University at events around the world, including your involvement on the university's International Advisory Board and your service on the Dean's Advisory Board of Sargent College. You've given your time and energy on a volunteer basis and with your husband endowed an extraordinarily generous professorship here. You are indispensable. We are inspired by your dedication, your talent, and especially, to return to the letter C, your character. Jean Knox, nurse, humanitarian, philanthropist, and cherished member of the Boston University family. We are proud to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Will Trustee Carla Meyer escort our honored guest to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Meyer. Mr. President, it is my very great honor to present Robert Knox for the university's honorary degree. Each holiday season, your elaborate model train display amazes everyone who sees it. And while it's good fun, perhaps your railroad hobby has been a source of wisdom and inspiration. After all, as trustee and board chairman, you've kept BU on the tracks through some very dynamic and challenging years, laying the foundation for great progress in long-term stability. Your relationship with Boston University began in the 1970s when you earned a BA and an MBA here. 
You built on that foundation to forge a very successful career as an investment banker, first with Prudential and later as co-founder and senior managing director of Cornerstone Equity Investors. With Cornerstone, you funded more than 100 companies. As distinguished and worthy of recognition as your business career is, we especially honor you for your philanthropy and leadership to an extraordinary per period of renewal and accelerating progress for Boston University. For 20 years, you served as a trustee of the university, eight as chairman, before stepping down last September. You served on countless committees and two dean's advisory councils. You've overseen years of ascending academic reputation, transformative campus improvements, and an emergence of as one of the great research universities in the world. You have also been a loving and devoted steward of Boston University's history and traditions. Together with your wife, Jean, you endowed a professorship. You sent your two children to earn degrees at our university. All the while displaying a low-key affability, generosity of spirit, and love of people that make you a joy to be around. Robert A. Knox, businessman, alumnus, trustee, and above all friend, we are proud to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Law, Honoris Causa. Will trustee Ryan Roth Gallo escort our honored guest to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Gallo. Mr. President, it is my great honor to present Nobel laureate Dr. Mario Molina for Boston University's honorary degree. As a young boy in Mexico City, you peered into a toy microscope and became enchanted by the world it revealed. Of such modest beginnings are scientific careers often born, but few so significant and transformational as yours. To quote an old adage, everybody talks about the weather. To apply it to, apply it to you, the adage needs a different verb. Those, there are those who do something about the weather. You were among the first. Your pioneering work in atmospheric chemistry identified the effects of man-made emissions on the atmosphere, especially the role of chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs, in the depletion of the Earth's ozone layer. In 1995, you were awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry for this work. Perhaps even more important, you've helped launch the study of man-made climate change, an issue so vital to be potentially existential. Your continued research and tireless efforts to educate policymakers and the media led to the similar agreement for global cooperation on climate change. Through the years, you've remained at the forefront of science, both as a researcher and educator at several institutions, including your current role at the University of California, San Diego, and your Mario Molina Center for Strategic Studies in Energy and Environment in Mexico City, which serves as an important venue for interdisciplinary collaboration. You've worked worldwide to develop climate solutions that are both environmentally and economically sustainable. You've expanded our understanding of the blue planet and bettered our lives upon it. Mario Molina, you've reached for the sky, both figuratively and literally, and on each count grabbed a fistful of history. With great respect and gratitude, we confer upon you the degree Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa.
Will Trustee Richard Reedy escort our honored guest to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Reedy. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Mr. David Ortiz for BU's honorary degree program. Five hundred and forty one home runs, one thousand seven hundred sixty eight runs batted in, ten all star teams, a four fifty five World Series batting average. Your statistics tell the story of baseball's greatest designated hitter. <laughs> At Boston University, we've witnessed it all from the best seat in the house, our campus, next door to Fenway Park. But numbers are just one chapter of a much greater story, that of your extraordinary leadership. As much as any late-inning home run, your joyful leadership carried the Red Sox to three World Series championships After 86 years wandering baseball's desert, it has inspired teammates to rise to their full potential, fans to rise from their seats, and fueled the franchise to a remarkable run of success. Your leadership has been evident outside the ballpark as well in your tireless, generous charity work. Your foundation has raised more than $2 million to help children here in New England and in your native Dominican Republic. Children who do not have access to critical pediatric services. But your most powerful demonstration of leadership came not with a bat in your hands, but with a microphone. Addressing the community at Thinway Park, in the aftermath of the marathon bombing. You defiantly, emphatically, and in your own elegant way, <laughs> reclaim Boston as our city. You lifted us off our knees to stand taller, prouder, and stronger than ever. It can't have been easy to find strength amid the sorrow but that's what leaders do. David Ortiz, athlete, philanthropist, leader, big poppy, you inspire us with your joy, enrich us with your compassion, and teach us with your character. For that, Boston University proudly confers upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Thank you very much. <laughs> Will Trustee Kenneth Mengus escort our honored guest to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Mengus. I have the high honor to present Bonnie Hammer for Boston University's honorary degree. Your television career began with a children's show where you tended to, fed, scheduled, and yes, cleaned up after a sheepdog. Humble beginnings but you decided to become the best dog handler possible. Your unflinching dedication to quality work led to you producing your own shows and ultimately to broad recognition 
as one of the most powerful women in entertainment. Your story is a reminder to all of us that it's not really where you start, but how you start and where you go from there. You famously transform world wrestling entertainment into a media juggernaut, even though you knew nothing of wrestling. What you did know is that great stories built around great characters make great entertainment. Time and again, you turned that deceptively simple formula into both critical and popular success. Today, as the chair of NBC Universal Cable Entertainment, you, you sit atop a sprawling empire that includes the USA, Sci-Fi, E, Bravo, and Oxygen Networks. You're responsible for a staggering number of hits, including Mr. Robot, Top Chef, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Monk, The Royals, and The Real Housewives franchise. You have been honored as well for your numerous contributions to social and humanitarian causes, including the Emmy Governor's Award for your Ease the Hate campaign. Bonnie Hammer, you are a role model and an inspiration. We are proud to call you an alumna and even prouder to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa. I now call upon Bonnie Hammer to deliver the 144th commencement address of Boston University. Wow, well, thank you, President Brown. Um, what acts to follow, a little scary. But 46 years ago, yeah, a little scary, I hate to date myself, but 46 year, years ago, who would have thought, not this chick, that she would be getting such an honor? <laughs> Amazing. Well, anyway, President Brown, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty and staff, friends and family, all the other wonderful honorees today, and most of all, the 6,500 32 members of the most distinguished class of 2017. Congratulations. But wow, look at you. You seem rested, relaxed, happy, actually sober. Could that be? I don't think I was back then. <laughs> Anyway, seriously, I'm so honored to share this day with you, especially because I didn't actually make it to my own graduation. Actually, I almost didn't make it to BU at all. I was originally planning to go to NYU, which was just a quick subway ride from Queens where I grew up. But my wise older brother said to me, if you go to school in New York, your mom will be at your dorm three times a week. All of a sudden, a four-hour ride up I-95 to I-90 seemed like a really attractive proposition. <laughs> of course, you know, once I escaped my folks, I realized not only how much I loved them, but how much I genuinely owed them for my success. So before we go any further, let's hear it for your parents. Come on. Your loved ones and everyone who has helped you get here today. Now, I certainly learned a lot during my time at BU. It was a great school back then, but it's even greater now. So thanks for my make, making my degree look a hell of a lot better now than it was then. 
And I'm a pretty proud alumna, really. So after grad school, I lucked into my first job in television. And it's been a really wonderful journey that's led me to my present home at NBC Universal. Over the years, television has changed a lot, and those changes only seem to be accelerating. But there's one thing that will always remain constant. Whatever the genre, if it's scripted, unscripted, even news and sports, television at its core is a platform for telling stories. And for thousands of years, you go. And all kinds of stories, they entertained us and inspired us. They shocked and charmed us. They brought us unforgettable characters, from Odysseus to Kim Kardashian. Now, I, for the record, had nothing to do with Odysseus, but Kim, I plead the fifth. So, you may not know it now, but whether you studied communications or engineering, law or medicine, business or classics, okay, <laughs> you all are storytellers. But when you leave today, you'll begin to write the most powerful, most meaningful, and most entertaining in many ways, the story of your life. It's the story of you. Now, as you can imagine, I've heard a whole lot of story pitches in my career. Some good, some not so good. And what I've learned is that the most compelling stories have five elements in common. First, the best stories have a strong lead character who undergoes some kind of transformation. That, my friends, is you. <laughs> Two, they have a supporting cast, cast of characters who help them achieve more than they can do alone. You'll meet them if you haven't yet. Three, they have conflict and adversity that the lead character must overcome. Trust me, that's common. Four, they're also grounded in an interesting and exciting time and place. That's now. And finally, they help us understand something that was hidden or undiscovered before. Now, with these elements in mind, let's talk about the story of you. And of course, like any good television executive, a couple of notes that may help you along the way. So want to hear them? Yeah. Okay. Well, you're captive anyway, so you're stuck. So here goes. So, the best stories start with establishing character. Not just likes and dislikes, strengths and weaknesses, but attitude. Because attitude sets the tone for something else. Something that is bigger than anything you're about to do. And I learned that on my very first job. I was working just down the street at a local PBS station called WGBH. I was a production assistant on a kid's show called Infinity Factory. As a PA, everyone outranks you. Everyone. You're often signed to a cast member to help them do whatever they need, whether it's running lines, making copies, picking up coffee. As President Brown mentioned earlier, I was assigned to one of the most popular members of the show's cast, the Sheepdog. Now, you know when people complain that their job is crap? <laughs> My job was literally crap. <laughs> because instead of picking up coffee, that's what I had to pick up. But here's the thing. I would do it all over again. That job taught me how important it is to understand the needs of your coworkers, canine or otherwise. Life, thank you. <laughs> Life dishes out plenty of crap, figuratively and sometimes literally. It's how you handle the crap that counts. Well, now, 
All characters need development, and your lead story does too. And nobody's going to help you more than some key supporting characters. After all, where would Batman be without Robin? Kirk without Spot? Serena without Venus? Ben without Jerry? Or for that matter, the other Ben with the other Ben without Matt? And maybe too early, but Trump without Putin? Oops. So who are the supporting characters who will be central to your story? The catalyst for your very best conversations and your biggest transformations. You've already identified a few of them. Your parents, your professors, your friends, those warm, caring, wise people we typically think of as mentors. For me, it was my father. But there's another type equally important, someone I call the challenging mentor. This is a person you think is your antagonist, but who ends up being your greatest ally. It's a person who pushes, criticizes, and challenges you to meet a standard of excellence you might not otherwise achieve. For Harry Potter, think Professor Snape. For Tom Brady, think Bill Belichick. I met my first challenging mentor right here at BU. His name was Harris Smith. He was a brilliant ex-Army sergeant who taught photography. And when I say taught, I mean he commanded the darkroom like boot camp. He would hold up a photograph and say, Bonnie, this is an absolutely piece of junk. He literally kicked me out of class and would not let me return and I, until I put in the effort to take a great shot. It wasn't fun. I was truly embarrassed in front of all my classmates, but he, I knew he was right, and I knew I could do much better. Throughout my career, I've had mentors who initially terrified me, but who ended up being the most nurturing at all. The most memorable was, and oddly still is, Barry Diller, a media giant, and my boss at USA and Sci-Fi many, many years ago. One Friday night, I got an email from him. Subject line, your decisions. Of course, I have to speak in his voice. Those two words sent shivers down my spine. Barry had a few questions about one of the shows on Sci-Fi called Crossing Over, which happened to feature a psychic. His question, if psychics are real, why was he on the science fiction channel? And if he wasn't real, why the hell were we in business with him at all? So that's right. If you think you're done with philosophy because you're wearing a cap and gown, think again. Barry's interrogation lasted the entire weekend. He wanted to understand just what I had decided and how my facts, my logic, my entire thought process. He forced me to think outside my comfort zone and create a watertight argument that I had to own. By 11 p.m. Sunday, I had reached a final conclusion. It was, you can't prove that psychics are real. So a show with a psychic exists somewhere between fact and fiction. Perfect for the sci-fi channel. Barry's final note simply said, OK, your arguments win. To this day, those are some of the best four words I've ever heard. I mean, sort of kind of right up there with, here's a promotion, will you marry me, and free drinks at the dugout. <laughs> All right. OK, that's fine. I cheated a little bit. My point is, these supporting characters are vital. And when they push you, you might stumble, you may even fall down. But once you get up, and you will, you'll end up standing even taller. Now, even fairy tales don't go straight from once upon a time to happily ever after. There's going to be. 
there's got to be conflict. And in most conflicts, your voice is the most powerful tool you have. The, time, the thing is, before you use your voice, you have to learn how and when to use it. And that starts not speaking with arrogance, but listening with humility. Who is your audience? What do they want to know? What are they trying to tell you? And how can you get them to yes? I once worked on a show where I knew my voice would never be the loudest in the room. I also knew it would be a couple of octaves higher than anyone else's because the room was filled with pro wrestlers and world wrestling executives. I had been put in charge of the WWE even though I knew nothing about wrestling. You can imagine how skeptical everyone was, including me. This was a recipe for hot tempers and high anxiety. My first task was to convince a room full of strangers to work with me and ultimately to trust me. Strangers who had necks bigger than my waist. So my approach, I sat quietly and I listened. I didn't cower in the corner and I didn't claim to have all the answers. What I did was figure out what they needed, what I had to offer. These guys knew wrestling and they knew their audience. I knew how to develop characters and build stories. I knew how to make good TV. And that very first conversation, which was honest and authentic on both sides, became the basis for an amazing 20-year work relationship and a deep friendship. Not to mention some fun wrestling along the way. So, find your voice, know when to use it, and just as important, when not to use it. So your attitude, your supporting cast, how you handle conflict, those are all choices your character makes. But there are two pieces of the story you don't get to choose, and that's time and place. 46 years ago when I was sitting where you are, or I was actually supposed to be sitting where you are, everything felt uncertain and unsettled. We were fighting a deeply unpopular war in Vietnam. Student protesters at Kent State had been fired upon and four killed by the Ohio National Guard. 11 days later, two more were killed at Jackson State in Mississippi. Civil rights issues were front and center. Many of us looked for guidance from BU's very own Howard Zinn, a beloved professor and prominent anti-war and civil rights activist. <laughs> Meanwhile, our technology and culture were changing rapidly. The modern environment movement was taking off. Women were rebelling against the patriarchy, And people on all sides of every issue were taking to the streets. We felt like we couldn't trust our leaders or authority in general. The future and our roles in it were open questions. Sound familiar? But when the stakes are the highest, that's when the world needs you the most. That's when your story goes from being about a character to being about character. Today, everywhere you look, people are retreating into bubbles, and those bubbles are hardening into shells. We're not willing to see, no less embrace difference. Now in my family, difference is a given. I'm a Russian Jew from Queens. My husband's a wasp from Cleveland. My stepdaughter, Kime, is half Malaysian. Her grandparents are Indian Chinese. My son-in-law, Ro, was born in Calcutta. And my son, Jesse's identity was informed by all of the above. Around our dinner table, difference is celebrated. But outside our home, that's not always the case. 
I remember the first time I faced anti-Semitism while studying in Kansas for a semester. I remember when Kime's elementary school classmate told her her skin was too dark. I remember being asked if my own stepdaughter was my son's nanny. But moments like these are the reasons it's so important that we listen to one another's stories and share our own. Many years ago at USA Network, we launched a campaign called Erase the Hate. It started as a series of documentaries highlighting stories of people from all walks of life. It became an award-winning initiative dedicated to acceptance and tolerance. Sadly, that mission is even more relevant today. In this moment of polarization, it's more important than ever that we pay attention to each other's stories. And that starts with you. I encourage you to take the time to figure out where other people are coming from, literally and figuratively. Learn about your own blind spots. Acknowledge your own fears. Listen to podcasts that make you angry. Read things that make you uncomfortable. Talk with, not at, people with different points of view. When you, step out, when you step outside of your own bubble, you'll develop empathy for people with whom you disagree. You'll develop a strong sense of self and become a better advocate for what you believe. If I've learned anything in the years since I graduated, it's that the most improbable stories are the ones that capture your imagination because they allow you to th see things differently, and they teach you something about your own character. That's the reasons we started telling stories in the first place. They help us understand things we didn't before. Today, your story begins anew. You have everything you need to make it a great one. The talent, the education, the character, and the voice. Now, all you have to do is write it, tell it, and live it fully. Thank you, and congratulations, class of 2017. Mr. President. You're ahead of me. <laughs> Provost Morrison. Mr. President, I have the honor to call for the presentation of the candidates for degrees as recommended by the faculty of Boston University's schools and colleges. To all the candidates for degrees, as your school or college and your degree are called, Please rise and remain standing until all the schools and colleges have been called. Mr. President. Professor Preston. Mr. President, I have the great honor to present the 2017 Arvind and Chandan Lanlal Kilachand Honors College Scholars. Mr. President. Dean Moore. Mr. President, I have the great honor to present to you the, the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Ministry as recommended by the Boston University School of Theology faculty. Mr. President, I also have the joyful honor to present to you candidates for the Master of Divinity, Master of Theological Studies, Master of Sacred Music, and Master of Sacred Theology as recommended by the faculty of the School of Theology. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. President. Dean Stetke. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degree of Doctor in Philosophy in Sociology and Social Work, and I have the pleasure of presenting the candidates for the Master's Degree of Social Work as recommended by the faculty of the School of Social Work. Mr. President, Dean Hunter. Mr. President, I have the honor to, to, to congratulate certainly all the faculty and also to recommend the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy, the Doctor of Science, and the Doctor of Science and Dentistry as recommended by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Masters of Science in Dentistry as recommended by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study as recommended by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Dental Medicine by recommended by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Dean Galea. I have the great honor of presenting candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Public Health degree as uh, presented by the faculty of the School of Public Health. I also have the great honor of presenting the candidates for Master of Public Health, Master of Science, and Master of Arts in Public Health as recommended by the faculty of the School of Public Health. Mr. President. Dean Antman. Mr. President, the faculty of the School of Medicine are honored to present their candidates for the degrees of Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Science, Master of Arts, and Master of Science, the future leaders of biomedical research and medicine. Mr. President. Dean O'Rourke. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degrees Juris Doctor and Master of Laws as voted by the faculty of the School of Law. Mr. President, Associate Dean Zed. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree as recommended by the faculty of the School of Hospitality Administration. Mr. President. Dean Coleman. Mr. President, I have the honor for the first time in, the, in our 99 history to present the Doctor of Philosophy degree and Doctor of Education degree as recommended by the faculty of the uh, BU School of Education. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Arts in Teaching, the Master of Education, Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies as recommended by the faculty of the BU School of Education. And wonderfully, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science recommended by the faculty at the BU School of Education. Mr. President. Dean Zlatova. I have the honor to present the candidates for the degrees of Master of Science, Master of Criminal Justice, Master of Liberal Arts, Master of City Planning, Master for Urban Affairs, and the graduate certificate recommended by the faculty of Metropolitan College. <laughs> Mr. President, I have also the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Liberal Studies, and the undergraduate certificate recommended by the faculty of Metropolitan College. Mr. President. Dean Allen. I have the honor to present the candidates for their Doctor of Musical Arts recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Arts, 
the Master of Music, the Master of Fine Arts, the Artist Diploma, the Performance Diploma, the Opera Institute Certificate, the Artisan Certificate, and their Certificate Advanced Graduate Study Degrees recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. <laughs> Mr. President, last but not least, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Music and Bachelor of Fine Arts degrees recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. President Brown. Dean Nijam. I have the distinct pleasure. I have the distinct pleasure and great honor to present to you the candidates for the Masters of Arts degrees at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies, as recommended by the Faculty of Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the great honor to present to you the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degrees in Asian Studies, European Studies, Latin American Studies, Middle East and North Africa Studies, and in International Relations at the Party School of Global Studies, as recommended by our faculty. Congratulations. Mr. President. Dean Moore. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy, the Doctor of Occupational Therapy, and the Doctor of Physical Therapy degrees as recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. <laughs> Mr. President, I also have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Science and the Master of Science in Occupational Therapy degrees as recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. <laughs> Mr. President, I also have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree as recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. President Brown. Dean Luchin. President Brown, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. And President Brown, I have the honor to present the candidates for Masters of Science and Masters of Engineering, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. And President Brown, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degree of Bachelors of Science and Engineering, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. Congratulations. President Brown. Dean Fiedler. Yes. President Brown, may I have the honor first to congratulate our distinguished alumna, now Dr. Bonnie Hammer. <laughs> Mr. President. I have the honor of presenting the candidates for the degrees of Master of Fine Arts, Master of Arts, Master of Science, and Bachelor of Science as recommended by the faculty of the College of Communication. President Brown. Dean Freeman. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Science, Master of Business Administration, and Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, as recommended by the faculty of the Questroom School of Business. All right, here we go. Mr. President. Dean Cudd. Mr. President. I have the great honor to present to you the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Arts, Master of Fine Arts, and Master of Science, recommended by the faculty of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Mr. President, 
I have the honor to present the candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts as recommended by the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and by the authority of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, given to the trustees of Boston University and entrusted by them to me, I hereby confer upon you the degrees that you have earned, together with all appropriate honors, privileges, and responsibilities, in token of which you are granted diplomas. My congratulations to all of you. Before you are seated, I would like you once again to turn and face your family and friends, especially your parents. Your accomplishments are built on the support of your family. Thank them again. Please be seated. The commencement ceremony celebrates the achievements of each of our students, but it means much more. It celebrates the accomplishments of a great academic community, a community where you have studied and worked together in classrooms, laboratories, and studios. It celebrates not only your accomplishments, but also the efforts of the faculty and staff whose dedication has helped lead you to this marvelous day. On your shoulders rest the enormous responsibilities for guiding America in the world and for addressing the sub substantial challenges we face. You are the future for this university, for this country, and for humanity. Among the graduates today are those who are commissioning into the armed services of the United States. You have chosen to dedicate yourselves to the protection of this country. This university is proud of you and gives you its sincerest thanks. Wherever your tours of duty may take you, Godspeed. <laughs> to the class of 2017, as you leave Nickerson Field, you're joining a long line of Boston University graduates stretching over time to include over 320,000 living alumni of this institution. Your accomplishments will be part of the fabric of our legacy. Your Boston University education has prepared you well. Go into the wor world and make it a better place for all of us and for all future generations. Again, congratulations, and good luck to all. Will everyone please rise as Ms. Marissa Plotti leads us in the singing of Clarissima. Words and music may be found on page 105 of your program. Following Clarissima, please remain standing for the benediction.
Bishop Sudarshana Devadar of the New England Conference of the United Methodist Church will now deliver the benediction. Following the benediction, the 144th commencement of Boston University will conclude. We ask the graduates and their guests, please remain in your places until the platform party, the faculty, and the alumni council have left the field. As you leave the banks of the River Charles, carrying the torch of learning, the torch of virtue, and the torch of piety, remember the words of Dag Hammarskjöld, former General Secretary of the United Nations, who said, I would rather see a sermon than hear one. In that spirit, as you go forth from this place, may the world see in you wisdom born of a love for learning. May your learning lead you to deeper thinking. May this thinking call you and guide you to work for justice, healing, and reconciliation. May it fuel your compassion and reverence for all of life. May it be the solid ground upon which you stand and the place upon which you land in times of trouble, tension, and despair. May the world recognize in you virtue born of humility that knows that it does not know, that lays aside assumptions in order to engage what is new and different with curiosity and delight, that values questioning and imagination more than answers and quick fixes that honors the truth and wisdom wherever they may be found. May the world experience in you piety expressed in reverence and respect for every living thing, devoted to nurturing goodness in oneself, in others, and in the world, and awed by the holiness and mystery of the universe. May learning, virtue, and piety flow through your veins like the waters of the Charles, connecting you with streams emerging from other origins, faiths, and traditions, and together flowing into the wide ocean where peace, love, hope, and joy abound in full measure. Amen. Thank you.